Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Porn Star Confessions. Today I'm like super fucking excited. I've got the legendary, like, king of all daddies, Rocco Steele. <laughs> so welcome, Rocco. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. So, how, I don't know. Because, I mean, I, I think most people would agree you're like king shit. Where where did this whole star where did this whole story begin? Oh, okay. This is my first oh, question. Okay, so um, a lot of people think I've been at this for a lot longer than I have. So when I tell people like I've only been doing it since 2014, everybody's like, "No, I thought you've been around for 20 years or more." <laughs> I'm like, "No, I'm just old. It, it appears as though I've been around forever." But um, so I was working. I was living in New York City. And uh, I was living there for like 30 years and working just like a soul sucking corporate job, a career I hated. I had hated it for years. It wasn't really my career of choice. I kind of fell into it by default, but I kept doing it because I just had to like pay the rent, pay the bills. And, uh, you know, I was always taught just to like, you know, have a job, have an honest job. And, uh, so I was doing that and I got to the point where I just, I just couldn't go on anymore. Like I could not do it another day. I could not like eat like the nights before I would go into the office, I would just be curled up in like a fetal position crying because I did not, it was just like, it meant so much more than it actually like to me, like to going to this job every day was just so much bigger than just going to the job. It represented so much more to me. So I had to like, just leave. And I left my job and, um, this was 2014 spring of 2014 leading up to that. I had had, uh, porn companies reach out to me because I was in New York city. There were other porn companies like, um, Tim, uh, treasure Island media and Lucas entertainment. Uh, although Lucas wasn't reaching out to me, <laughs> um, and Ray dragon, uh, was reaching out to me because they would see my profile on, um, daddy, no, not daddy hunt. Um, manhunt, manhunt. God, it's been so long. You remember yeah. manhunt? Yeah. So anyway, they'd reach out to me and they'd ask me, uh, if I was interested in filming, and uh, I kept saying, no, it, it just wasn't something I wanted to do. Uh, and then after like several, several months of uh, them approaching me, spe specifically Ray Dragon, uh, I finally said yes. And Ray Dragon, uh, hey, are you, uh, we look like we're frozen. Are we frozen? Are you there? Uh, yours is lagging a little bit. My site's good. I can. Oh, uh, okay. Because your screen went black, so I didn't know. Um, I don't know, that's good. All right. So, uh, Ray Dragon kept reaching out to me. Uh, I finally, finally in May of 2014 said, yes, his studio was like an hour outside of New York city. So I was like, okay, I'll go up there and I'll film. It was a solo. Um, he was like, look, if you don't like it, you never have to do it again. If you like it, then, you know, we'll film some more, like maybe one-on-one -on -one scenes. And I, I did it and I didn't die. So I was like, Hey, it was kind of easy. It was easy money. I walked away with like, you know, a chunk of change. I was like, okay, I could do this. And then like, I came back the following week or maybe two weeks later and I filmed like a one-on-one -on -one scene, uh, with Hans Berlin. Uh, and then I filmed with like Adam Russo all with like Ray dragon. And, uh, and then it kind of like, I started saying yes to other companies in New York. This is all the summer of 2014. And back then, like, you know, nobody was doing porn, you know, there was like, the porn industry was very small. It wasn't on there. No only fans. Yeah. Uh, there was like a uh, select 30 guys in the United States that you really knew about, right? Like there were your raging stallion guys. There were your, um, uh, Jesus, the studio that's, that's no Titan, your Titan guys, your raging stallion guys. Uh, and, and like really, and they were like 30 big names, right? So it was easy to kind of know everybody. And, uh, it was kind of, I think easier to kind of become a bigger name 
And I was like the first older dude. Like if you looked at the, I'm just saying that the number 30, if you looked at that number, that group of 30 guys, like nobody was older. Like everybody was like twenties, thirties. And all of a sudden I arrive onto the scene and I'm 50. I just turned, I'm just turning 50 at the time. And uh, everybody, and I have a big penis. So everybody's like, oh, who's this old dude with a big penis? So everybody started like, I think paying attention because it was very easy back then. You know, now it's really hard to get noticed. Like it's almost impossible to stand out nowadays. I mean, there must be hundreds of thousands of guys doing OnlyFans, right? So anyway, I think it was like right place, right time, right situation. I was 50. I was one of the first, if not only old, older dudes. I mean, like, um, Ray, God, why can't I think of Ray? Ray. Can't think he does the, uh, fornication parties. Ray Dalton. Yes. Ray Dalton. Probably. Yeah. Ray Dalton. Ray. I'm sorry. When you see this, I forgot your last name. Ray was around. So Ray had like preceded me and he was around and he had a name. Uh, but like, I was one of the few. So anyway, that's how it all happened. And then I went to like a month later, I flew myself. Nobody was doing this at the time either. I flew myself on my own dime to Europe and I filmed with Tim Tails and some uh, Butch Dixon and, and, and Treasure Island in London. And I just like hit Europe, right? And then all of a sudden, like people in Europe knew me. So I just did a lot of like right things back then in 2014. And again, if I did those now, I don't, I don't think anybody would care. I don't think I would stand out. Uh, it would not be easy to make a name now. So I'm grateful for when it happened and how it happened and all of that. So here I am nine years later and uh, I'll be 60 next year. I keep threatening to retire. <laughs> Never seen that happen. I keep getting pulled back into it. So going back to the beginning, because you have a, I can't tell if you actually have your JD or if you just studied law. No, I actually have my JD. I have a diploma up in the closet. Uh, I graduated from law school, oh, the law school in Ohio. I went to night school for four years. I worked for the public defender's office in the daytime and I'd go to class at night. Uh, and then, uh, the problem is around the same time, I was also coming out of the closet, like in different stages, I was in my twenties. So I'd already come out in my early, early twenties, like 19, year, eight, like 19, as a 19 year old, 20 year old, I came out to like my closest friends, but then like in law school, I kind of was like, you know, I started discovering like gay bars and all that stuff. And I'm starting meeting a group of friends like in, where I went to law school and stuff. And, um, and I started experimenting with drugs like while I was in law school. So it was not like a good combination. Um, so I got through law school, I graduated from law school, but then I was like, then I moved to New York city, like literally like two or three days after graduation from law school. And the intention, the int intention was to study for the bar exam that summer. So I graduated in May. July was the uh, New York bar exam. I decided to take a few months off and do the winter exam, which was the biggest mistake of my life because that summer I was just like a kid in a candy store. And so I just, my, my drinking and my drug use just spun out of control. And I uh, ended up taking the bar exam in February, but failing miserably because I was just like not serious at that point. I had already, I'd been out of law school for now, like what, six, seven, eight months. And I just, my heart wasn't in anymore and in it anymore. I just was enjoying myself, enjoying living as a young gay man in New York city. And, um, so I took the bar exam another time. I failed it again. I studied for it a third time. And, uh, after realizing like I just wasn't getting any better at my testing scores, I just decided to hold off on it. And uh, at, this, at that time, I had started getting sober. So I decided just to focus on my sobriety. This was 1998. 
And uh, so I put everything on the back burner, including like studying for the bar exam. And I never went back to it. Like I'm now in December, I'll be 25 years sober. So that was my focus, getting my life together. And, uh, you know, I always thought someday I'd go back to it, but I just never have. Hmm. I mean, getting your JD is not an easy task. I mean, that's just impressive on its own. Yeah, I mean, it was so. it was not easy, it was especially not easy working a full-time job in the day. But I was young and I was like, I was, you know, I had the energy. I was in my 20s. I was young. Life was exciting uh, in a different way. Life's always exciting, but life was exciting in a different way. Uh, everything was new and you know, being gay was new and being with boys was new and meeting boys and dating boys and taking drugs and all that stuff, going to parties and clubs. That was all new. And unfortunately, that took precedence <laughs> over serious studying uh, and then focusing on the bar exam. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the straw that broke the camel's back where you said like, Fuck this lifestyle. Like, I just want to be sober. Um, I was working at a law firm uh, as like a research, like a law clerk, research assistant kind of situation. And um, uh, it was just like, I'd be, I just remember I would be stuck in a law library all day long. And back then we didn't have, we didn't really have computers yet. It was the nineties, but like we didn't have access to the internet like we do now obviously so you were in a law library with piles of books and like you know post-it noting books and like you know relevant parts of cases and all that and that's what my life was and I was just and then I would go home and I'd go out and party every night I lived in the West Village uh, in New York City so I lived by all the bars like back then there was like a whole cluster of bars on Christopher Street um, there was a whole cluster of bars in Chelsea, like between Christopher street and Chelsea, like you had everything, um, you didn't have to go any further. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so that's what I did. I would just go out all the time and I do lots of drugs and come home really late. I go to all night sex clubs in the West <laughs> village and, uh, I'd come home at like four or five, six in the morning and then try to go to work the next day. And I was just like, it was just a, I was really messy. Like I would take cocaine to work the next day and like go to the bathroom, that whole thing. Like, you know, trying to like get through the day cause you're so worn out. And then you just hit a point like, <laughs> like right after lunch where nothing in the world is going to like pick you up. Like you crash. And then I was like doing shit, like falling asleep under my desk falling asleep in bathroom stalls. Like it was just messy. And I thankfully a little alarm went off. I had this like internal alarm clock. I still have it. Whenever, when, whenever anything is unacceptable to me in my life, that alarm clock goes off. And thankfully it went off back then. And it said, this is unacceptable. This is not like living. This is not how you want to live your life. Uh, and I had had, thankfully I had a very good friend who had gotten sober two years before me. He and I worked at a restaurant together in Soho. He dealt, he dealt blow out of the back of the restaurant. Like, it was crazy. Like we, we'd get drunk and wait tables and go downstairs and do blow in the bathroom. And, but anyway, he got sober and he stayed sober for two years and he was living this really like a life of integrity and honor and respect. And I really, uh, wanted that. So I reached out to him and I said, look, it's time. Can you take me to a meeting? And so he did that night. And that was December of 1998. And literally I never, ever looked back, never picked up again. Um, no more alcohol, no more drugs, no poppers, no nothing. So. Good for you. So I'm curious, what do you attribute that alarm clock to? Because a lot of people kind of need to hit rock bottom first. But. I mean, they say that, like, everybody has their own bottoms, right? So, like, um, that was enough for me. Like, some people have to be, like, institutionalized, you know, jails, hospitals, you know, mental institutions, all that. Uh, 
before they before they wake up. And then some people don't ever. I have a family member. That family member will family member will never get it. And that family member is older than I am. Um, and you know, by the I am not religious. I'm an atheist, but by the grace of the universe, like I got it, you know, uh, I just, it was enough for me. It was, again, it was unacceptable in my life. That was my, that was the bottom for me. Um, like missing work. So the final, final thing was I had gone out all night. It was just the same old thing out all night. But this time I was at a sex club doing cocaine till like nine o'clock in the morning. I was supposed to be at work at nine 30. I rush home cause I live in the West village. The sex club is in the West village. I run home, take a shower. And I'm like, okay, I could still get to work by like nine 40. I'm just, I'm just going to lay down for a second and rest my eyes. And I lay down on the couch in my living room and I woke up at like two in the afternoon. And um, I don't know how I saved my job, but I did. And I showed up the next day at work. And thankfully, like not a lot of people were looking for me that day. So I had my own office on a different floor. And not a lot of people were looking for me. So I kind of got through it. And that was when I closed my office door, picked up the phone and called my friend. Like that was it. Like it was such a close call. And job a job was very important to me, right? Like no matter what a job is honorable. Even if you hate it, soul sucking, whatever, keeping your job is honorable. So I just couldn't lose my job. And that's why like, and also as living in New York city from a practical standpoint, I didn't want to lose my job and be on the street. Cause like I was paying my rent. I was paying the bills. I was, you know, all that stuff. It was me. And if I didn't do it, then I'd be on the street. Yeah. No, I get that. So, like, when you first started in porn, did you ever even have the slightest inkling that you'd become the gay porn star? No, absolutely not. Like, I mean, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, it, it, it was just like, oh, we're going to do this, see how it goes. Yeah, no, literally, I thought I would, like, um, yeah, like I, I couldn't believe it. Like uh, Boomer Banks and I were really close friends at the time. And Boomer helped me a lot uh, in the early days, like helped me pick my name, helped me get some of my first jobs. Uh, he helped tweet me like he was the person that was like, hey, everybody, here's a new person. You know, he's my friend. And like, like he helped a lot. And uh and I started seeing how people were reacting, like when he would post that tweet, like everybody follow Rocco, right? And I was like, whoa, what's happening here? This shouldn't be happening. Like, also, I had, you know, I didn't think I was attractive. Like, I did not think I was an attractive guy. And, um, you know, I thought like, I just didn't think I was, a, I was attractive enough to be in this industry. Uh, so it was really the fans and the industry over the years that kind of helped me build that confidence and made me realize that, oh, okay, I guess I belong here. Um, so I, yeah, like it was, it was kind of like a crazy, crazy trip. Like the first six months as I kept like seeing like my fan, like, or my follower count grow on Twitter and all that stuff. It was just like, you know, and back then I thought it was crazy to even have like a thousand followers. <clears throat> I was like a thousand people are interested in me. Like what? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I get I'm extremely humble. I still am extremely humble. Uh, there are times I have an ego, but it's not usually related to Rocco's TLS and other things. But, um, yeah, I'm, I think still, still, I'm kind of like, I still wonder like, what do people see in me? Like nine years later, I'm like, there's all these like beautiful, beautiful men out there, right? Like from all over the world now doing this. <clears throat> and I'm like, why are, why is anybody paying for a membership for me? <laughs> so 
I don't take anything for granted. I never have. And um very grateful for every day that I get a payout from OnlyFans. <laughs> like every day I am grateful for that payout. I do not take that for granted. Yeah. One thing though that I I'm curious like I agree humility is amazing. But like if you rewind the clocks like 20 years ago, like twinks were like the big thing, right? It was all about like hairless guys and kind of like the Abercrombie look and all that. And it's like, now the daddy thing is super in. And I mean, virtually everyone who'd fall into the daddy category, you know, like Will Angel, Jack Dixon, so many other guys yeah. that, you know, I've interviewed, they're like, thank God the daddy thing's in right now, or, you know, I'd be screwed. And I almost wonder if you were really like the, if you created that, because, you know, when you first came in the industry, it was like, there's these guys and then there's you. Like, do you feel like you had a role in making the whole daddy thing well, super popular? I'd like to believe that, like, I helped break the glass ceiling, like, I'd like to believe it. Not, of course, I wouldn't take full credit for it, but I'd like to believe only because I was one of the first. But again, like Ray Dalton was there too. And there were a few other guys, uh, you know, around the same age range. I mean, Adam Russo is also, you know, Adam, Cutler and I are the same age, you know. Cutler and I, we've been friends since day one. And uh, he and I, like, turned 50 the same year. So, or same summer, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Sure. Sorry, Cutler. I don't mean to give your age away. <laughs> but like, we're the same age. And uh, so Cutler is a daddy. I mean, like, we, yeah, I mean, I'd like to think, like, I don't know, I think, I'd like to think, again, right place, right time, we brought attention to it and was like, hey, you can be hot at this age, you know? And I also think because of what you said, like, twinks and hairless and all that stuff. I think, again, people were, it was ripe. People were ready for something really different. Um, you know, Raging Stallion was always doing like the beefy, hairy, bearded guys, right? Like I remember when I started and even before I started in 2014, I was watching Raging Stallion movies and looking at their exclusives and they were like big muscle bearish guys. Um, but they were still fairly yeah. young, right? They were probably still in their thirties and stuff, but like, yeah, I, I mean, and I agree 100% with like Jack and all of them, like, thank God, because I, I was telling, who was I telling very recently? Like probably my best friend back home in Ohio. And I was like, God, like when I was in my twenties, like we just, we were kind of like, I don't want to sound like a dick but like we were kind of like ew old people like ew I maybe mean, like 40 years old right like ew get away from me don't look at me you're you're an old queen and they'd be like 40 like but i remember <laughs> like i remember in new york city like the gay rags like hx magazine and next magazine you'd flip in the back for like the pickup like where you'd like that's where you'd cruise people right like there wasn't any you know, there are no dating apps. Like, yeah. That's how you met people. You put an ad in the back of HX magazine and there'd be shit like, you know, no olds, femmes, fats, this whole thing. Right. Like that all was able to people were able to talk like that back then. And um, so they would say, like, you know, nobody over 35 or nobody over 40. So that was like considered old. So, like I said, like thank God, like, it's fashionable. <laughs> like, all of it's fashionable. Like, it's all good now. Like, I'm so happy that, like, we've gotten rid of all that kind of, like, labeling and, and, and restrictions on, on, on stuff. I mean, people can still feel that way personally if that's what they choose to feel. But to be able to publicly say shit like that and shame people because of whatever ageism or the color of their skin or how much they weigh and all that stuff. I mean, thankfully we, we are moving on into a better place. Hopefully. Um, yeah. Sorry. I went on and on and on about that. 
No, no, no. I, I agree with you 100%. What are you, like, do you feel like, though, that change has come about a lot because of the fan sites? Because before, you know, the studios would, if they didn't cast you, you right. didn't Absolutely. get work. But now yeah. it's anything and the fans yeah. are the ones. I mean, I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's the millennials, it's the Gen Zers, it's the fan sites, which the Gen Zers and the millennials have, have kind of supported it and made it a thing. So as a result, every guy is getting, ex every type of person is getting exposure, right? Like not just who the studios chose. And that's the part I love. Like, um, yeah, it was literally always the studios would dictate like what was attractive. Right. And now like, yeah. Like I love seeing, I love flipping through Twitter and it's like, it's what I've always said. Like anybody can be sexy, just be sexy. Like choose to be sexy, like own it and have swagger no matter what your body type is, no matter what. Like I have seen like so many different types of guys that I just, I'm just like, whoa, like, I wish I had their confidence. And, um, and that is like, incredible. that's incredibly <laughs> sexy to me. Like, um, and so, yeah, I think 100% the fan sites have, have made all of that. Like, what has that been like though, for you watching all that happen going from what it was? To... So as like, you know, I'm a very, kind, compassionate person, right? Like that's just who I am. So I believe, I've always believed this. I've always believed like, I've, everybody's like, who's, what's your type? I've, I don't have a type, but I know that sounds like a, um, a cop out, but it's true. Like I do not have a type. If you're sexy, you're my type. Like, and sexy can mean so many things. So watching it, like watching our community evolve and, and, and see the beauty and seeing the sex appeal and all of these different types of people is, is really nice to see. Um, I mean, the alternative is not, we don't want the alternative, right? We don't want a community that's like, we don't want the no fat femmes, fats, Asians, or old people, right? Like we don't want that. Um, so if we're going to be a strong unified community, that's one of the ways we're going to do it is accepting everybody and not from like a sexual aspect, just accepting everybody into our community. Um, no matter again, what you believe, what you look like, how much you weigh, how old you are. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And, one thing, though, because I got a feeling you have my same experience when it comes to this. Ha does it ever surprise you how many, like, female followers and fans you have? Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, it always has. But, I, but again, it's opened my eyes to, like, you know, sex is a spectrum, you know? Like, women can find gay sex exciting and... Uh, fun to watch and all of that. Like I have a really good friend. She was a follower of mine on Twitter uh, back in 2014. She started the Rocco Steel fan club, like back in 2014, 2015. Uh, she and I are like, she was a follower for a long time, but then she and I went like off Twitter and we've now had like, we now talk on the phone and exchange. We tweet back and forth all the, not tweet, text back and forth. I'm so old. <laughs> we do that thing, that thing on the keyboard, um, back and forth. So like, she's become a friend of mine and it's funny how it's evolved because she, she's always been very respectful. And I find that to be true of a lot of the women fans. They're very respectful and they don't objectify you. Right. I don't know. At least that was my experience. It's very interesting. Yeah. 100%. They don't 100%. objectify you. They they come from a different place of like uh like beauty and all of that and um and yes, they might find you sexy, but it's 
it's not like, it's just in a very respectful way. And I've always liked that. And I've always welcomed uh, women, like fans and followers, always. Um, I try to like respond to them as much as uh, anybody else when they show up in my timeline or like the, in my DMs and stuff. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> and let's take this moment to address the straight okay. thing because for those of you watching before this interview, I post, uh, made a post on Twitter and several people had referenced like, Oh, was Rocco always gay or like, when did you decide to, to switch from being straight? <laughs> so if you want to set the record straight on that. I just, uh, like I told you, I just find it so interesting, A, that anybody cares, right? Like, I don't, I don't get it. I find it to be so exciting. Like, when I see other performers, and I'm not going to answer the question yet. I'll get there because I'll let people, like, like yeah, yeah. what's he going to say? <laughs> but, like, when I see other performers and they come out, like, they start their careers as bisexual or pansexual or you know, what they do whatever the fuck they want. And I'm so envious because I know that like, if I did that now, I would lose a lot of followers. And from a practical standpoint, like from a human standpoint, I should say, fuck it. I don't care. I am, you know, I am me and, you know, I am what I am type of thing. But from a practical standpoint, who needs to pay the bills and needs to have a career, uh, I'm not retired yet. I'm saving for my retirement. So I need the fans. I need the followers. I need the subscriptions. So, like, I can't just do that. And uh, when I film with um, a trans man, um, which I, like... I filmed a couple times with um, Triple X Trans Man, who's a friend of mine. Uh, I find him incredibly sexy. We have an incredible time. And I would film with him like 50 more times. But every time I do it, I catch shit and people start accusing me of being straight. So it's interesting that you asked the question or that somebody brought it up when you, when you tweeted that. Um, because I just find it so interesting, like, why why does it matter? But clearly it does to some people. Um, why does it change anything that you see me doing? Like, why does it? I mean, the answer is absolutely no. Like, I've never, ever, ever been with, a, like, a woman. Ever. I've only been with men. Ever. And I'm not saying that to try to convince anybody. Because it's just a fact, and if people want to believe it, they're going to believe it, and there'll be people that refuse to believe it still. And that's all I can do. Like, that's all I can do. Like, I just think it's really funny that anybody gives a fuck about anything. I think, like I said, sex is a spectrum. Sexuality is a spectrum. Um, if I woke up tomorrow and wanted to be straight only, I have the right to do that. Like, yeah, I might lose most of my followers, but that's what I believe. I believe that that's sexuality, and I believe that uh, it is a spectrum, and you could stay in one point on that spectrum your entire life. Um, like, do I like to watch straight porn? Fuck yeah. Do I like to watch women get fucked? Yes, I do. Have I ever fucked a woman? No. Do I have any plans to fuck a woman? No. But like that's where it's where it's a spectrum for me. Like that's where I don't land in one specific place. Like, and again, I'm open to the fact that if I woke up tomorrow and I wanted to do that, I can. And I just find it really interesting, as I'm sure a lot of us do, that anybody has a problem with that. Like, how does it affect anybody's life? But I know this is like, you know, I'm preaching to the choir and all the people that are going through what we're going through now with drag queens and, and trans and, and all of that and trying to not convince people because I don't think it's our job to convince people, but just, you know, support each other so that everybody can be who they are 100%. Yeah. 
No, and the thing is, like, every single performer I've interviewed, if they shoot any type of buy content, and myself included, like Gunner Stone, he receives yeah. tons of flack for it. Yeah. It's like, oh, why are you shooting with women? Like, yeah. Just, I mean, it's like, you know, I haven't retired I yet. So who's to say what, you know, what I might do next year or next month or whatever. But right now, you know, I am a gay man and I have sex with men, period, for now. No. Oh. So has bodybuilding always been a part of your life or are you just the most genetically oh my God. person on planet Earth? Oh, my God. I don't know. This is really funny because I have never, I've never considered myself a bodybuilder and I am in the, like the worst shape right now. So, uh, I have been forbidden by my doctor to be on supplements anymore in my life. I will die. Um, I've already lost my hair. I've already had to have a hair transplant. Um, so I am very small now i am like 208 and i will never get bigger than that uh it's very hard now to uh to kind of stay in sh the shape that like i've been in for the last nine years so thank you for saying that you think i'm a bodybuilder but it's never been anything i've been like uh my body's kind of always been like I don't know. I go, I, when I used to do supplements, I was much, I could get much bigger, but never into the, never to the point where like I could ever compete. Like I was never like, I was just, I would just get big. Right. Like, but I wouldn't get defined and I've never had abs. Like I've never had abs in my entire life. Um, really? Yeah. I mean, there's, there might be a couple pictures out there where, they're le they're legit because like it's like like I don't know it's a good day the light is hitting just right <laughs> and I haven't eaten anything yet that day and haven't drank any water but like there's a couple pictures out there I've never ever had anybody like Photoshop abs because I never really for myself ever cared about them it's not something I look for in a guy so um, I've never really. Yeah. So I've never had abs. I've just never really been defined in a lot of places on my body. I'm happy with my body. Yes. I wish it was bigger right now. Uh, unfortunately it's where I'm at probably for the rest of my life. Um, you know, I enjoyed a decade on supplements, but it took its toll on my body and, um, I can't do it anymore. So Anyway, I'm glad like some people thought I was a bodybuilder. <laughs> no, I mean you've always had a very impressive. Oh, physique. thank you. Like, have you always worked out though? Yeah, but not a lot. I don't know if you saw my tweet like last week. I said I wish I could be gym obsessed. I'm barely gym tolerant. <laughs> like, I do not like going to the gym. I am. I do not like. Why? I've, I've done it my whole life, but I don't enjoy myself while I'm there. Like, uh, I, I, I do my workout, but I get right out. Like I get in, I get out. I'm, I'm, I'm like, it's, I'm doing it begrud begrudgingly the whole time. <laughs> so it's a means to an it's end. It's a means to an Nothing end. Nothing more. Yeah, exactly. Right. And probably, uh, you know, I've done it more than I cared to do it because of, being in the industry for the last nine years. So, um, you know, I've stayed with it for the last nine years. God forbid what I'm going to look like when I retire, because I might just let it all go. <laughs> okay. Before I forget, there's one thing I wanted to ask you about, because for those of you watching, if you've never seen Rocco naked, he's <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> With that being said, I'm guessing you have had the same issue that I do where a guy can be too tight to the point that it's physically painful yeah. and it feels like it's in a exactly. vice grip. What advice would you give 
to people out there who are bottoming, who are too tight or don't know how to relax, like, because I'm guessing you deal with that. Just yeah, I mean, I, I would do. say, um, first of all, uh, get rid of the misconception, not you, but people that tight is good. Because I don't know, I don't really know who, who tight is good for. Like, and it's not good for most guys, even, you know. Uh, so tight is not good. Um, and, and, and also the misconception like, oh, daddy, I'll let you open me up or I'll let you stretch me out. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you need to get there before you see me. Like you need to get there on your own and then we will meet. Because especially if you're filming, I mean, uh, thankfully I, I vet very well. Like people I film with, I make sure they've taken a cutler or they've, you know, type of thing before I film with them. Um, or they've taken a Tim Kruger. And um, so, but every once in a while I'll run into a guy that's just like super, super tight and you waste like, you know, 45 minutes or an hour just like barely getting in. And then either you have to call the video completely or it turns out to be a really bad video because I mean, you're faking it and People can't see penetration and all that stuff. So it's, as far as filming goes, like guys need to, like bottoms should just know, they should not have like, like a bigger appetite than they, what's the, what's the word? Uh, your eyes are too big for your stomach. <laughs> your eyes are too big for your hole. Yeah. Like, you know, be realistic uh, as to like what you can take. And then the advice, like, I know you asked me for advice. I don't know. It's just, there's, it's not really rocket science. I would just say like, you know, there are things out there to stretch yourself. Um, you know, guys who will send me videos and they're like, look daddy. And they're sticking something about this big in their butt. And I'm like, okay, you need to like increase the size a, a bit. Like that's not doing any good. Like it might feel good to you, but like, you're not prepping yourself for me. Like you need a series of things that get larger and larger and it's not an overnight thing. It can happen. I think a lot of guys can eventually open up. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's not an overnight thing. I think it's a series of larger toys and you continue to stretch yourself and yeah. Yeah. What's the vetting process <laughs> when you shoot with someone? Basically I'm, I'm on like my timeline on Twitter and I'm looking at, like just big blown out holes <laughs> like, and I'm reaching out to them like first, <laughs> like I always say like, I need a fisting bottom really. Like I like to have sex and film with fisting bottoms because then, you know, they can take you. Um, so like, you know, obviously if there's, yeah, if there's a guy with a big blown out hole, <laughs> Which, like, that's the thing now, like, on your timeline. It's just, like, blown out hole after blown out hole. So, it's like a smorgasbord. Um, so, I'll, like, reach out to the person, depending upon where I'm filming, of course. Or I will, if I'm going somewhere, like, a Rome or a Barcelona or whatever, because right now I'm, like, only filming in Europe. I'll be like, hey, who's going to be here on these dates? And then people reach out to me. And then I'll say, like, who have you filmed with? A lot of times if you're in Barcelona, a lot of these bottoms have filmed with Tim Kruger. So that's a plus. Um, so, yeah. So that's really how it is. I just ask who they film with. Like, do you have any vi videos of you, like, shoving a big old toy up your butt? And they'll send me that, too. Um, like, I can tell also, although I've been wrong a couple times, I can tell if a guy sends me a whole pic. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> like, it's a pretty... It's a really pretty <laughs> hole, but I'm not like we're not doing anything. <laughs> Have you ever had to ice your dick after a shoot? No, no. Right. I've only had to ice my dick at a show in Brazil when it wouldn't go down because I injected oh. too much trimix into it. This is the this is the subject of a tweet today, by the way. Um, a couple people have reached like tweeted that I'm 
not as hard in my videos as I used to be. And it's because I've decided to stop doing Trimix because it's not natural. It looks great on camera, but it, it hurts. It doesn't feel good to fuck on Trimix. Um, I'm not enjoying sex. Um, so people are getting the real me now, the real authentic me who's enjoying my scene, right? Anyway, back to the story. Um, Show in Brazil uh, in front of like 5,000 hot Brazilian guys. And I'm so panicky that I'm not going to be able to stay hard for the show. So when I'm panicking and I'm nervous, I have anxiety, it takes more Trimix. So I'm injecting more Trimix, injecting more Trimix. And it's just like, we like, they're like, okay, come on, we got to go out on stage. I'll start walking out on stage and my dick starts going down again. I'm like, wait a minute, I got to go back. I got to do it one more time. So this particular time, I just like, oh my God, I don't even remember how many syringes full of Trimix went into my dick. But then like the show was over and I'm just like, <clears throat> and it was, it hurt so much. Like I'm like bent over in the dressing room and I'm like, ah, ah. I need to go to the hospital. I need to go to the hospital. And all these guys, like the promoter and everything, was bringing just like literally bags of ice. Like, and I'm just literally like putting bags of ice like on top and on, underneath my dick. Uh, it eventually worked. So, yeah. I've never had to ice it after. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've, I've been in that same position that you were in in I don't think a lot of people realize, actually, I've never talked about that with anyone. Um, is it downsized to Trimix? Because a lot of people think like, oh, you just use Trimix and it's great and everything. But it's like, no, there's some serious negatives. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know if you have problems pissing on it. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, I don't. That's one thing I've always been able to do. And like, studios, like, like film oh, that stuff like Lucas Entertainment lo like loved it like oh my gosh you can like piss hard on Trimix so um but no it's like I you know sometimes I come sometimes I don't a lot of times it hurts especially and guys who are like like normally like big like I mean they have like big holes like sometimes when I'm like engorged so engorged on Trimix like I can't even like have sex with them um, because it's just like, my dick is just so much thicker and bigger. Again, the fans love to see that, but it's just not sustainable. I mean, after almost 10 years of doing yeah. that, like I have a urologist, we all do, whoever, whoever, you know, if you're doing it, you have to see a urologist, right? Yeah. So I have a urologist. And the reason why I have this urologist was because the very, very first time I ever did Trimix, like nine years ago. I did. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I ended up in the emergency room. Fourteen hours later, you know, you've all heard. We've heard those horror stories. You may have them yourself. Like fourteen hours later, a, a hard penis almost lost the use of my penis completely. There may have never been a Rocco steal. Um, this was before Rocco. It was like right before Rocco. And um, so this this urologist in New York City like literally brought my dick back like. We literally did like penile uh, therapy, like for me to like, like exercises to get hard again and all that stuff. Cause like for like several weeks, I couldn't get hard again anyway. Cause it like, there was that whole risk of like damaging the tissues. If you stay hard too long on Trimix, cause it's the fresh blood is not, sorry, I don't know if you want all this on your show, but like the fresh blood is not feeding the penis. Uh, and that's what was happening. So. Rocco almost lost his. Yep. No, I had the same thing. 14 hours, and that was before I knew about the antidote mm -hmm. and all. Yeah. I think everyone, if they started it long enough ago, goes through that yeah, horror story. I agree. Yeah. Like back then, there was no fun. anecdote. I mean, it did, but we didn't know about it. So, yeah. No, and, and the thing, too, I'm curious, like, it really desensitizes me. Is yeah, that what it does absolutely. to you? Absolutely. Again, that's why, like, one of the reasons I've chosen to go off of it. Because uh, I'm just, you know, I, I'm just, 
I'm just old, and but not old in a bad way. I'm old enough to say, "Fuck it, I want, I want to enjoy shit." Like, you know, I'm 59 years old next month, and I'm like, you know, the good years are slipping away. Why am I not enjoying, you know, sex? Oh. So, and I got it. How has porn affected your sex life or sex drive, I should say, like off camera? It hasn't. However, only fans affects it, but not from my end. So I am a very intimate person okay. sexually. And I, whether I'm on camera or I'm hooking up, I am very intimate with my partner. Uh, I like passionate kissing it's the thing that gets me going whether i'm on camera or not and so what i find is now it's very mechanical uh it's very for the camera only nobody really gives a fuck about i shouldn't say nobody very few people care about a connection it's just about getting that uh you know shot which for me the money shot is the passion. It is all that stuff that makes it special. Uh, and that's the thing that people come up to me at meet and greets and all that for the last nine years saying, that's why I like your porn because you treat the bottom a certain way and you're really into it and all that stuff. And um, so for me, it's been harder. Like only fans has changed it because nobody wants to just fuck. Everybody wants to film. Like, and yeah. if you dare to like text somebody or not text, but like DM somebody and say, I want to fuck like people are like, you feel like you might be being too lecherous. So you like, I'd love to collab. So now it's like, I just want to collab rather than I want to fuck. So it just kind of like, it's kind of really interesting. Still trying to figure it out, but you know, a lot of people, ah, I find a lot of the younger people are just into collabing. That's why I like, I really enjoy sex with people older my age, and, you know, because you don't have to worry about only fans. You don't have to worry about, you know, people worrying about how they look on camera and stuff like that. They're like, everybody else just, you know, people like, I don't know. I think, yeah, I'm probably just going to like really piss off a bunch of young people. But like, I just find like, you know, you don't have that with the older gays, you know? You feel like they're more open to having sex off Yeah, off I camera? mean, because a lot of them aren't, you know, a lot of them aren't, they don't have OnlyFans accounts, you know? Yeah. Um, I feel like, and maybe it's just my perception I feel like OnlyFans is the new Grinder. I've never been on Grinder, but like it seems like OnlyFans is the new dating app. Like, you know, it's the new way to hook up and people see like your movies and all that stuff and your videos and you know, it's how you attract people to have sex with or more you know, people to film with. Um I don't know. My own Damn. Point. I never thought about it like that. I don't know. Before. I could be completely wrong. And maybe I'm just, again, like, you know, shut up, boomer um, type of thing. But, like, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, you have a valid point. Absolutely. It seems like it's the new, it's the new grinder. Cause it's every, I mean, especially since COVID, like everybody, everybody, like I used to go through like my timeline and I'd look at so many guys. Nobody had only fans accounts. They were just hot guys. They'd be models or something, or maybe not. Maybe they're just hot guys. Now everybody does. I don't. I don't judge it. You know, people need money, but it's just like I think it's changed sex. I think. Damn. No, that's interesting. I I feel like I'm having one of those moments where you drive by a building every single day, but you don't notice it until someone actually points it out, and you're like. How the fuck did I not see that? I, you know what I mean? Wow. Okay. How have you never been on Grindr? Well, uh, I'm curious. So, okay. So here's an interesting thing. 
when I started, okay, so let's rewind a little. In 2012, I became HIV positive. In, in 2012, barebacking was not a thing, okay? Uh, prep was not a thing yet. So, and here I was, uh, HIV positive, honest with everybody. So I wasn't going to like lie about it. But the only place really to go when you're HIV positive in New York City to have sex with other HIV positive people was bareback. No, uh, what was it called? B BBRT? Bareback Real Time. BBRT. Yeah, it was a website and a hookup site, right? So everybody's barebacking. A lot of people were HIV positive. So basically from 2012 to the time I started porn, 2014, that's where I would hook up and meet people. Then in 2014, I became Rocco and I could never have a Grinder account because there were so many impersonators at the time and still are. Not as many now because now they're picking on other people. There's so many other people out there. But like at the time, like I was like, you know, the daddy with the big dick in 2014, 2015, 2016, whatever. So like I could not have a Grinder account because nobody would ever believe it was me. Like, so I would always have to get all of these accounts shut down. I'd have to write to Grindr and all this stuff. And I'd be like, look, I don't have a Grindr account. I will never have a Grindr account for this reason. Please just shut these people down because they're trying to scam fans out of money and credit cards and all that stuff. So they helped and they would shut down any rock. I said, shut down any Rocco account you see. And they said they were, it doesn't, it's not true to this day because there's still Rocco accounts that pop up like whack-a-mole. Um, but not as much as it used to back then. And that's why I can't have a grinder account to this day. I don't really need one. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I feel right. like no, when I swing sense. into a town, I feel like, you know, you just put it up on Twitter. He was like, I'm here. <laughs> How do you feel about, like, your fame? Because, I mean, you, you, I, I relate to what you're saying about, you know, you just think you're a regular guy, nothing yeah. special. I, that's how I view myself, but, like, you're Rocco Steele. Yeah, I mean, how so did... I'm married. I have a very private life, uh, very private, and it will always be, and I compartmentalize my Rocco time and then there's my private time uh, that's very special to me so sometimes when I then travel to another country and I walk through like the neighborhood and people and that's pretty much the only time people know who I am like sometimes through an airport I notice like people call out my name but especially just when I go to like a neighborhood, right then people know who I am. Or if I go to, obviously, like a club or something. But outside of that, nobody knows who I am. And I like that. Like, there was a time, there was an exciting time in the early days when I liked that. Like, I really liked getting recognized. And sure, like, deep down, deep down, I was like, oh, you know, could this turn into something? And then very early on also, I realized, no, it was never going to. Like, you are this and you're never going to be more than this in people's eyes. And that's okay. That's 100% okay. It gave me a career. It let me travel the world. Uh, it's giving me my retirement plan. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. And that's all it is. So fame, uh, I never really thought of it that way, except for, like I said, a very brief moment in the early days when I was, when it was exciting. And then I kind of checked myself very early on. Uh, it, it, it hurts me kind of, uh, pains me when I'm at a meet and greet and somebody's fumbling over their words because they're so nervous to be around me. And I'm like, no, come here. I'm like nothing. I'm nothing. Like I'm no different than you. We are two people talking together. Yeah. That's it. And people like get over their like fear, hopefully. But then sometimes people don't. I'm just like, ah. Oh. Like, so that's kind of how I, it, it kind of makes me uncomfortable because I don't, I don't believe it exists in our world. Uh, 
you know there's our, there, there are celebrities yeah. and we are not celebrities like there is fame, there is true fame and that's not us like i walk through the neighborhood and yeah. yes a couple people know my name but outside of that you know and that's okay when i see these young that act like so, you know the kardashians i'm just like oh honey honey <laughs> i'm like you know have your moment have your moment it's exciting but you know <laughs> yeah no, i get it so want to go back and tie two things together because you talked about like being sensual and passionate and stuff and i forget <sighs> talking to lance charger or christian mitchell or yeah. one of them and they were saying that they feel like a, one of the big reasons that a lot of women watch gay porn is because it captures actual intimacy. Uh, and I sat down, I thought about it, and I was like, I really can't recall any kissing or intimacy in straight porn. Um, true, but I don't really see it a lot in, in gay porn either. Uh, uh, I, I do see it, and I and when it's really passionate... I gravitate towards it, but it's very rare. I mean, most of the stuff I'm watching is guys banging guys from behind like a fucking jackhammer and like one speed wonder. And it's just boring to me. And uh, <laughs> like, I mean, like, yeah, I'm really I like face to face. I do. You know, I like a doggy. I like a doggy style, but I also like. I always come hands down every single 500 and whatever, 50 videos on OnlyFans, every single one of them, I'm coming missionary style because that's intimate, like looking into the bottom's eyes and making out with them and all that. But I don't see uh -huh. that happen much. I almost definitely don't see it in straight porn. You're right. But I don't see it much more in gay porn. Yeah. I see a lot of... And uh, like, like I said, jackhammers from behind. That's like, true. I'm like, slow her down, slow her down. Like, yeah, enjoy the ride. That's what I'm like. That's what I like about sex. Like, I like to enjoy the journey. I don't like to like just bang away and get it over with. There's so many different angles and positions yeah. and things, and they feel. Everything feels different and different angles. And you move the bottom's leg this way and it feels different for you and him and all that stuff. Like, um, and all that stuff is exciting to me when I'm watching it. Sorry, I know I'm off track. I'm off track from the intimacy factor in women watching porn. But anyway. No, I think you're right. No, but, uh, and, you know. I just don't think there's a lot of that happening. I don't see, I see a lot of tricks, a lot of acrobats, like a lot of acrobatics going on, like, you know, which is great. There were certain studios that were notorious for that. Men.com loves the acrobatics. Um, but then people do it too, like in their only fans. And they, so anyway, all I'm saying is like, all that takes away from the intimacy of just being like with somebody like, one-on-one -on -one with somebody present with somebody. And um, I am meeting up with a couple guys in a couple weeks in Berlin. And I will tell them that I want whatever happens for that hour that we're filming, it has to be this, like it has to be that connection because that is going to make an exciting video for people. Like, yes, I will in you yeah. from behind but like there has to be that connection even if like we you walk out the door you walk out my yeah. hotel room at the end and we never see each other again that's fine for that hour we both need to be present because i don't like and i have i have made videos that didn't have that connection and you're just like uh but when it does happen you're like oh my god i can't wait to share this with people you know yeah. So anyway, back to what you're saying about no, I agree, women yeah. watching it. I don't know. I just think it's um, maybe it's the carnal, like the primal part of it. Maybe 
maybe they like that. Maybe, you know, uh, I have a, this friend of mine, she's an uh, erotic, gay erotic author. This friend of mine who was a follower who ran my fan club, all that. She's a gay uh, erotica book author. And uh, all of her customers are women that buy her books. Um, and yes, there is, wow. it's very fantastical, lots of fantasy, um, more romance, but there is a lot of like, you know, gritty stuff going on in her books too. So they like all of the above, I think, but I don't know. I'm glad they do. Oh, that makes sense. So one thing I'm curious about, because you travel a lot, do you actually enjoy it or is it like the gym where it's just a means? No, the travel it? is the best. Like I, I love traveling. I met my husband traveling. Uh, he was living in another country. He's American, but he's living in another country. I was traveling to that country. I was filming in that country for Naked Sword at the time. Um, and I met my husband. So like, I love travel. I, it's, it's the reason why like we did not adopt children because we want to travel for the rest of our lives. We want to buy a place, uh, like in another country, uh, when we retire, like all that. So I love experiencing other cultures. Um, and I haven't been out of the country where I live. I have not been out of this country since May, May 17th. It's only June 22nd and I have wanderlust now. Like I have so, I have wanderlust so bad. I want to get out. I want to travel. And I do have a trip coming up. Uh, I have two trips in July, um, two different places in Europe. So Jeez. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I mean, it's, it's, there's a pain in the ass aspect of it. Like the, the airports and the TSA and the security lines and, and people, human beings in general. <laughs> but um, once you're at the destination, uh, it's just like, I don't know, especially when you're constantly going to new places. That's what's exciting for me. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm happy it makes yeah. you happy. Um, let's see. We got... Uh... Have you ever had a film scene get canned because you were too big for the bottom to handle? No. There was one that just stands out to me. Um, there were a couple in the early, or literally back in 2014. One was uh, uh, Lucio Saints movie. Lucio Saints is a, a Spanish uh, porn star who also had his own website similar to like Tim Kruger has a website, right? Uh, I don't think Lucio has his website anymore. But anyway, I filmed a scene uh, with for Lucio with Alan King, little Alan King, who does a lot of uh, Lucas Entertainment stuff. Uh, at the time, Alan was brand new and couldn't really take a dick very well. <laughs> and um, I could literally get this much of my dick in him. But it's a beautiful movie and it's a very popular movie still. Like I see people like posting it, like a scene from it or a pic, or whatever. But like my dick barely got in most of the movie. Like, you know, I'd say maybe the most was halfway in. And it was a condom movie. This was back in 2014. So it was a condom movie. It made it even oh, more shit. difficult, right? So like. And then the other one was for Butch Dixon, which was a London-based studio. I don't know if they still exist anymore. Um, I filmed a scene for them, uh, and it was this little, little, little twink, little tiny little twink guy, and he literally started crying and ran off set and locked himself in the bathroom for literally like two hours. And I'm just like, um, it's like 8 o'clock at night, and I'm like, the director, I'm like, um, are we going to do this? It's like, yeah, 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 everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. Sure enough, around eight o'clock, the kid finally came out of the bathroom. And um, he was just like, let's just get it over with. And he powered through it and uh, we finished the scene. But no, I've never had anything completely canned. 
I'm thinking possibly an OnlyFans, oh. maybe like maybe one or two OnlyFans were false starts, like you know, uh, over the years. Yeah. Like people that just could not take it, and it just nothing was happening. So, and again, wow. that's why I don't let that happen anymore. It's just so much time for both people, right? Like it's so much time yeah. wasted. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. So, when was your first experience with a man? Oh gosh. <sighs> okay, well, with a man or with a male? Male. I'm just going to assume male. Okay, so when I was a kid, my best friend and I would do stuff. Like, we'd have sleepovers and do stuff. And um, and I was like a total top back then. Like, we would take showers. I know this isn't, we're not supposed to sexualize this. I'm not sexual. I'm being very clinical. We would take showers and I would... <laughs> Uh, penetrate him in the shower, but again, we were both children, or not children. Ah, we were both you know, young kids. Anyway, I don't even know if we can play this part, but yes. So my neighbor friend, best friend, we used to do stuff as kids. Then nothing happened again. Uh, we both entered high school at the same time, and the minute we entered high school, he cut it off, and he said, "No more." No more. I'm not gay. Well, we didn't know what gay was, but he was like, no more. I don't do that anymore. Right. So then I went to high school and I went to college and college was like, I belonged to a very straight fraternity. I was the president of my fraternity and I never really touched another dude again until I graduated from college at the age of 22. So for all through high school, all through college, oh. at the age of 22, I graduated from college that summer. I got a job at a restaurant. I met this guy at the restaurant and he and I were like doing it all summer. So yeah. So that was like my probably real first man experience. Uh -huh. And uh, my first male experience was as a kid. And I used to like, um, as a kid, I oh. used to make all the neighborhood boys like pull their pants down in the shed in our backyard. And <laughs> like, <laughs> And all of them, like every single one of them turned out to be straight. I was the only one, like, I guess because I was like the ringleader, right? Like, I, it was no surprise that I was the gay one. <laughs> the ringleader. Were your, was your family surprised no. when you came out? No, they all knew. My, I have three, I have three Ow. older sisters. Uh, who would talk to my mom and they're like, over the years, be like, you know, they think, we think he's gay. He doesn't have any girlfriends. Da, da, da. And my mom was like, yeah, you're probably right. So like my mom was like totally chill and fine with it. And they're like, my mom was like, don't worry. He'll, you know, when it's time, he'll tell us. And my parents were divorced. So like my mom was remarried. And I had a stepdad. Um, so finally one day I was in law school and I'm at my mom's house and my mom literally just confronted me. And she's like, so when do you want to talk about you being gay? Like literally that's exactly what she said to me. Uh, and I was like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And uh, I'm like, how'd you know? She's like, I've always <laughs> known. She's like, I've always known. A mother always knows. That's exactly what she said. And she was so cool. My mother was like this uneducated housewife from the Midwest didn't have more than a, uh, you know, a grade school education, but was very, you know, very liberal minded, very open minded, uh, you know, very loving, compassionate woman. And uh, so she was, she was like, can I tell your sisters? And I'm like, yes. So then my mom went and told my sisters and then my sisters approached me and they're like, can we tell dad? My dad wasn't so great about it. Like my dad was like this really macho Italian guy and his didn't want to hear that his son was gay. He was fine. He just didn't want to talk about it. He didn't he didn't like, you know, he didn't like disown me or anything like that. He just never wanted to talk about it. To the day he died, he never never came up. He never treated me any different. 
So everybody was fine. I was very fortunate. I had a very supportive family. I have nieces and nephews. They're all supportive. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, the reason I asked is because you don't, I don't, this isn't really, I guess, politically correct to say, but you don't act gay, you don't talk gay, you don't have any gay mannerisms. You see what I'm getting at, right? Yeah, yeah for them, it was just, just like a, a, a yeah. bro dude. Yeah, for them, it was just that I never, ever had a girlfriend. Like, there, and I was like, you know, oh. ever and never, like, talked about girls or anything. So, like, here I was, like, you know, in my 20s now. Um in law school, like approaching 25 years old. Right. So like still nothing. So, and I don't know how well, like, yeah, there wasn't yeah. anything else, like no other evidence giving it away, like that would make yeah. them think other than just that. Oh yeah. That makes sense. Hey, Cause I feel like at that, by that point you should have had like a crush on Pam Anderson or something. <laughs> you know? Well, here's the funny thing. It wasn't Pam Anderson, but it was Farrah Fawcett. I mean, I was a kid in the 70s. I had Farrah oh. Fawcett posters all over my room. I mean, the the iconic Farrah Fawcett poster in the red really? swimsuit. Uh, it was all for show. And Charlie's Angels. I had all the Charlie's Angels posters in my room. It was more of an obsession with their, I thought they were beautiful, beautiful women, but I wasn't like, you know, I didn't want to bang them. <laughs> like, oh, what a pretty sweet <laughs> Okay. No. No, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Okay, that's a good one. Because someone asked, how do you keep up your shape and beauty at your age? We already talked about the the bodybuilding, but like one thing I'd love for you to address is aging okay. because I've interviewed quite a few people who are like super hesitant. Like they don't want to say their age and you know, like they're dying their hair and you know, like what advice would you give to the older men out there? Just say, fuck it. Like, I guess you would be like the, the Tina Turner of gay porn. Just age very gracefully. <laughs> um, so I'm in no place, in no position to tell anybody like what to do uh, because, number one, for example, I was at uh, the Bear event. I forget the name of the Bear event in Dallas. Uh, Dallas Bear event that's in March. And they have a Botox booth. And I was right up there getting Botox with everybody else, like right in the middle, like literally in the middle of the expo hall, like you're sitting in the booth and people are walking by and they're like, you know, I have no problem. I have no problem. Um, I do things, I do maintenance things, um, but I just take care of myself. I think getting rid of alcohol and drugs 25 years ago helps preserve me a little, um, you know, waking up several mornings a week hung over and dehydrated and all the toll that drugs takes on your body. I think it ages a person. Um, but again, I've had, a, I've had, I've had stuff done, you know, not a lot, but I've had stuff done, maintenance stuff. Uh, my, uh, I had, uh, eyelid surgery a year ago because my upper eyelids were getting really droopy and, uh, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a place where I can afford to have maintenance stuff done. So, um, you know, I'm never going to be like Madonna. <laughs> no. I'm never, never yes. going to show up. You said it. I, I agree. I'm going to show up one day with like, you know, braids and like that. God love her. I love her to bits, but she needs to stop. <laughs> so the advice yeah. I would give is do what you need to do to make yourself feel good. It's your life. I think aging is a really important topic. And I'm glad you brought it up because I have a talk show. It's on hiatus for like a year now. But I have a talk show and I think when I re start it back up again, it's only going to be 
aging issues because I don't think anybody's talking about them. And we are the first openly out gay generation that's aging or queer generation that's aging. Like when I was young, all of my elders were dying of AIDS. So we lost a huge chunk of our elders and now I'm becoming an elder. And so I think it's really important. And, and, you know, we don't have an example to follow. Right. So we're like, you know, there's definitely guys older than me, you know, but I'm part of that. You know, I'm approaching 60 and there's guys that are like 80, 90 gays that are and queers that are eighties and the nineties. So how do you do it? How do you age? Like, you know, what are all, I mean, there's so many different topics in aging and with queer aging uh, that's very special and unique to aging as a queer person. So um, I think we just, the advice I would give for whether it's beauty and beauty maintenance and all of that and fitness is just like, you know, do it, do all the things that make you feel good and stay healthy and and talk to other people and have the conversation because uh, I don't think it's happening and I want to start having the conversation um, about how to age and how to do it with grace and dignity yeah. and because um, it happens if we're lucky enough to stay alive, it happens to all of us, you know? Oh yeah. No, I think the biggest part for most people is just the accepting it. Like accepting the fact that they're 40 or 50 or 60 yeah, and understanding you're not in your twenties anymore. You can't, you I know think, what I mean? I think the, yeah, absolutely. Good point. And I think that is a lot of it. I had a hard time and I had to go into therapy when I was approaching 40 on how to accept turning 40. And then 50 came really easily. 50 was like, I couldn't wait because I was quitting my job and I had this whole life, new life ahead of me. Um, now I'm, I'm having, I'm having some emotional and existential issues approaching 60, but it's going to happen whether I fight it or not, it's going to happen. So it's like, how do you rhetorically, how do you, how does one make their life as rich as possible? Because it's going to happen regardless. Um, so I say, you know, stay healthy, uh, keep moving, keep your body moving, stay healthy, quit the fucking partying, like go out, go to parties, you know, go to the bars, go to the clubs, but stop, you know, stop the, the, you know, the dangerous drug use and all that stuff. I have no problem with people drinking and doing drugs. I do not. I'm around it. It's part of my job. I'm around it, but Let's face it, it's not healthy. Doing supplements that I was doing for 10 years is not healthy for me anymore. So I can't sit here and preach and tell people what to do, but it's a suggestion. All of these things are gonna make you healthier so that you can live a richer, fuller, longer life. Uh, because aging is happening no matter what. So yeah. embrace it and start defining what aging is gonna look like for you. Like for me, it's going to be travel. It's going to be travel. It's going to be, you know, retirement soon and traveling and buying some property somewhere and, and, you know, living my best golden life, my golden years. Um, and I just, you know, set a, set an example for the younger people, right? Like do it in a way that sets a good example for younger gays and show how it's done. Because I don't know, I have I have nobody to look to, to tell me how to do it and how how did you you know how did you approach sixty, how did you do it without like freaking out, you know, so yeah yeah no I get that anyway so somebody wanted to know if you could do a deep ASMR growl. <laughs> I don't I didn't I don't even write know what it. That is I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know what it is either. 
I think that was it. I think that was it. If I had to guess, that would be it. See, I'm too old for this ASMR stuff. I don't even know. I mean, I know what it is, yeah. but yeah, sorry. That's that's yeah. as good as it gets. No, it just hurt my throat doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt. Um, do you uh, bottom in your personal life? I do not. Uh, I haven't bought them since 2016. Okay. Uh, I did it on a dare, basically. In 2016, it was Madrid Pride 2016. And um, yeah, it's literally been seven, what, seven years? Wait, yeah, seven years. Um, it's not out of the question, but like, it's just never... I don't know. I, I know people are like, oh, you don't know what you're missing and all that stuff. I get it. I can intellectualize that. It's just not something I ever want to do. I like being on top a lot. Yeah. It well, I imagine you bottoming would be hard to do because the person who's wanting to top would probably see your dick and be like, nope, you're top of me. <laughs> I feel like that would happen ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, I but. mean, yeah, I mean, the time it happened in twenty sixteen, basically, it was like, yeah, then I flipped over and <laughs> took care of that person. So, but um, you know, there's been talk, and there's been talk very recently about my last movie, and not like my last OnlyFans, but my last movie which talking about with directors uh well-known directors about doing something really big and just the idea was thrown out that what if Rocco bottoms at the very last like five minutes of the movie you know like a real plot right. twist or something but um you know I think you'd have a blockbuster. I think it would do. There. I think it would make a lot of money, but I also think like I'd lose some people. But it would have to literally be at the end of my career when I was just like, okay, I'm hanging it up anyway. Yeah. If people are disgusted with it, then fine. But I think it would be a. It would be like a cool way yeah. to kind of say peace out. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I like that. Um. I love his jocks, but can't find them anymore. What's up? Uh, I've, I've, yeah, I, I shut down my business, uh, my underwear and jockstrap business about two months ago. Uh, I had had it for seven years. I had the business for seven years and I, um, I just like was tired. I was just, uh, the, the market had changed so much. So when I, when I started like the whole thing in 20, like when I left my job in 2014, really the whole reason I left my job was to start this business, this underwear business. I wanted, it wasn't to start porn. Oh. So I left my job and I started designing underwear and working with a factory in China. And, and it took until 2016 to launch the website, to get my first pair like made and to save money for it all and all that stuff. Like the first, I didn't know what I was doing. So the first like batch of underwear cost me like fucking like $15,000. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever you need, whatever you need. If you say I need 10,000 pair, I'll take 10,000 pair, whatever. Uh, which was like so stupid. And I ended up with like an underwear that I had to donate to like a homeless shelter years later because I ordered so much of it. But anyway, that's why I quit my job. And then I was doing like porn to save money for the production of the underwear. And then, so then I launched the underwear site and then it started like, you know, paying for itself. Um, and then years later, fast forward again, the market had changed so much that everybody in the world was making underwear. Every single influencer out there or anybody with a 10,000 followers thought they needed to have an underwear brand. God bless them. More power to you. But there was just, you know, too many players in the market. 
And there are all these, you know, there were the Andrew Christians and the JJ Malibus and Nasty Pig and all that. They were a whole different, you know, level, right? Like I didn't even, I wasn't even on their radar. Yeah. But then there's a bunch of little smaller, you know, companies down here like me and all these other smaller guys. And we were all competing for that share of the market. But then that grew, like that, that pool of smaller underwear companies just grew. And I just got to the point where I was like, Ugh, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of designing. I'm, I live overseas now. It's too difficult to do so many different things. My, my distribution center was in LA. So like I'd be ready for bed at night where I live and I'd be getting all these questions and, and returns or not or whatever from my distribution center. Right. And I was like, uh, so I was just ready to move on. I shut down the business. I oh. literally donated all the underwear to a homeless shelter in, in LA. I donated all the jock straps to a charity that is called Stick It In LA, and they promote uh, vaccinations and HIV testing and all that for for gays. And so they would use uh, they would go out to all the gay pride festivals, and they would give free a free jock strap if you got like a vaccine, a monkeypox vaccine, for example. So I feel very good about how it all ended up. Like I've got some, you know, homeless people in LA wearing my underwear now. <laughs> I've got, you know, guys with a monkeypox vaccine wearing a jock strap. Um, I was done. I was done. So everything's done. Everything's gone. There's not a. There's not a thing left in the warehouse. <laughs> oh shit! Okay. So I know you keep your. Uh... Someone asked if you're in a relationship, which obviously you're married. Um, without getting too personal, how long have you been married? Uh, it'll for? be six years in August. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Which? Uh, oh shit! <laughs> what? <sighs> this one. Okay. This. Are these coming part. in like as you're talking? Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So, if he can offer words of encouragement to baby gays and baby trans living in the unsafe parts of the world, I l I'd like that. As for questions, I guess I'd want to ask him what the most fulfilling moments of his career were. And I'm curious of Mr. Steele's opinion of loneliness and isolation within the LGBT oh. community, particularly among gay men. Oh. That's yeah, like that's a amazing they're all amazing but like i'd literally be here for like uh each one of them <laughs> yeah that's them requires like a separate it. show seriously i'm not making a joke out of it i think they're all amazing topics and questions um god um i i can't speak to like being trans in unsafe parts of the world i live in a i live in a country where it's very unsafe to be gay period. Um, so I can't even imagine, uh, like, you know, wanting to transition in, in, in a country where, like where I live right now. Um, I can go fly to a different country on the weekends and be gay, right? I can get my gay on, but if you're like living your life and wanting to transition in the, in a, in the country where you live, like you're there, you can't go anywhere and you, you're just trying to be yourself. So I can't, I can't speak to that. I only know it from the standpoint of, I, I do live in a country that's where that would be very dangerous. Um, so I don't have advice. Um, uh, the loneliness and isolation, that's such a, God, it's, that's literally, it's a, it's a show within itself. Um, because it's so <laughs> maybe you got an idea for your show right that? there. I said maybe you could answer that like way more in depth on your show. Yeah, I mean show. it's great. It actually is a topic for aging. Uh it's literally one of my topics for a show under aging is like isolation and uh like friendships. You know, as you grow as you age, you lose friends, friends go in different directions, people die, all that stuff. So but, you know, I understand it's an, you know, it's an issue at any age. 
um, it's hard because, you know, if you don't have a family, uh, you know, that you, that you can depend on for support, uh, because typically I would say, turn to your family, but families can be really fucked up, right? You know, you may not have one. And if you have one, they might be fucked up and not supportive of who you are. Um, you know, and then there's like your chosen family. And if you're in a big city, obviously you can go to the community, the community center, the gay, the gay community center and meet friends and sign up for events or, or go to events and sign up for courses or whatever. Like there's things like I lived in New York city. So there was always things, right? Like, uh, independent of bars and clubs. Um, and it's not easy to speaking of, to walk into a bar and club when you're by yourself and feeling alone and you don't have somebody like a friend to walk into a bar and club with. Um, it's, Again, I, 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 I couldn't give like advice in like just a sentence or two um, because I feel yeah. like uh, it takes some time to, for me to really reflect on my answer because I don't want to just sound like a dismissive answer because um, I think it is really important and I don't want to dismiss somebody who's feeling that way. Um, but like I said, like, you know, not everybody is fortunate or have the privilege of living in a large city where there's a large gay population. And even if you do, that could be even more lonely, right? Like I remember being lonely in New York city, you know, there were times, uh, and I was surrounded by people. Um, yeah. I think you're right though. A lot of it is, because a lot of people think of like gay cultures, like the bars and the clubs, but like you said, going to the community center and finding, you know, cause there are gay groups for anything and everything, regardless of what you're yeah. into, you know, and just finding those like-minded yeah. people. You know, one thing I will say, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. One thing I will say is it's very easy to look at social media and to see on Instagram, all of these gay people surrounded by friends and living their best lives. And, and then you, and then you reflect on your own life and you're like, and you compare to that and you're like, Oh, I don't have all those friends around me. I, and, and it makes you feel even more lonely and that because, and, and that perhaps you're not measuring up because that's the standard that social media sets you know, not just gays, like the whole, the whole world, like the, everybody's out there living their best lives and taking pictures of it. Um, I went through a really dark period this year. Um, I lost my mother and I went through just a really dark place emotionally and I'm out of it now. I have good therapy. I have good antidepressants. Um, but I also, and this is just a teeny little bit of advice that may not solve loneliness and isolation, but don't feel the pressure that your life has to be this gay only life because that's what you're looking at on social media, right? Like everybody's going to gay events. Everybody's going to social parties. Everybody's surrounded by beautiful gay boys in speedo bikinis on the beach. So your life, get that out of your head. You have to have that life and you have to be living an only gay life. One of the things that saved me, and it was a huge thing that saved me this year in my dark period, uh, because I was living in a country. I left all my friends back in the United States. I'm living here for my husband's job. And I just moved here and then my mom passed away. So talking about feeling really isolated, what I did was I found something that was of interest to me. I wanted to learn how to start painting. So I went to a gallery in my, in my town. I don't even speak the language. Thankfully they knew some English and I found an English speaking uh, art teacher and I've been taking painting lessons ever since January. And now 
I have friends at the gallery. They're not gay. They're just friends now. And like we share common interests and um, I have this new passion. I paint, I'm painting all the time. And now I like hang out with people from the gallery and I, it's just, it requires a little work to combat loneliness and isolation, but it doesn't have to be combated with just gay things because that's very limiting, right? Like if you like bars and clubs and circuit parties and, and, you know, summer, summer houses on fire Island, you like, that's really intimidating and out of reach for a lot of people. So find, and again, I live right now in a, in a really like, isolating part of the world and like so it can be done nobody knew who i was so it's not because people knew who i was and they opened accepted me into their world i had to start from scratch and i'd be like hey i want to take art lessons can i take art lessons here and by going you know four days a week to art class and and you know painting every day and people coming and going into the gallery and taking pottery classes and all that stuff while I'm painting, like you meet new people. So I would just say, and sorry, it's really long-winded, but this whole thing came to me, is like find no, it's a really good thing that interests you. Like it doesn't have to be painting. Maybe it's dogs. Maybe you can work at a dog shelter and you're gonna meet all these like-minded people that love dogs. You can go and feed the dogs and walk the dogs, you know, and then you're going to meet all these other people that are there too, that love dogs and love helping dogs. So that's probably my best advice because I feel like anybody can do that. Like I'd be really tone deaf if I sat here and said, Oh, just go to a circuit party. There's tons of gays and they're all around you. You know, like that would be really tone deaf of me because it's not accessible, nor is it necessarily the healthiest thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's amazing yeah. advice. Um, that, that actually uh, ties into the last question I have for you. Well, there's one more fan question after that, but uh, what else do you enjoy like what makes you tick? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? What's your typical day like? <sighs> People, I'm sure they imagine, oh my God, you're Rocco Steele. You're just fucking all day, yeah, which is yeah. not the case. It's not that at all. My life is very asexual most of the day. Like, I wake up, I walk my dog, have coffee with my husband, see my husband off to work. Uh, I go to painting class for a few hours. I come home, have lunch, walk my dog again. I go to the gym for a couple hours, come home. Uh, where I live, there are other expats, Americans that live here. So I know some of them and sometimes we'll go have a coffee or I'll go to their apartment, have a coffee. Um, it's a very boring, but wonderfully boring life. Like, you know, and then I travel a lot. So that's my life here at home. But when I travel, then I'm, I travel and sometimes I'm filming when I'm traveling, but a lot of times I travel for travel's sake and for seeing another part of the world. And then it's just, you know, I wake up, explore the city where I'm at. I go to art museums. I go to, you know, temples. If it's Asia, I go to temples and eat lots of amazing food from that country. And so my life is not sexy in the way that people I think think it's sexy. I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I'm of an age where all of this is perfect for me now. <laughs> perfect. So someone wanted to know, did you have fun fucking Colby? G oh, yes. 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 That was one of the funnest. Yeah. That was one of the funnest things I've ever done in the industry. Colby's a great guy. Wow. Super genuine. Uh, no attitude. 
to me, like I was nervous meeting him because to me, he's bigger than life. And he's a big dude. Back then, I, when I met him, I was big too, but I'm not big anymore. But um, super, super nice guy. A lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. I didn't realize like what a big bottom wow. he was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is your opportunity to plug anything and everything because you also have a YouTube. Channel. Well, I do. It's on. Like, it's on hold. Like I said, it's I'm on hi hiatus right now. We're re regrouping. Uh, I'm trying to find a co-star. Co-star. Um, I'm trying uh -huh. to find another because I want to only do the aging thing. Like, um, so I'm trying to find somebody on the East coast that's maybe the opposite of me, maybe young, maybe they're the, you know, uh, whatever, uh, maybe it's opposites would be good. Or maybe it's another aging gay queer person, gay or queer, gay and or queer, <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah. So I don't know. And it's just a big question mark right now. It's something I want to do. I feel like it's something that I should do. It's something I am an authority on. I'm not the only authority, but I am an authority on aging as a gay male, approaching the age of 60 and, um, and my lifestyle and all that and my background. I think I have a lot to talk about. So that's, it's just on hold because of that. Um, yeah, it's called Just Oral with Rocco Steele. Uh, the first year we did two, two years, two seasons. Uh, first season was like, like talking to porn stars, but kind of about like general stuff. But then second season was like strictly like sexual topics and fetishes and stuff like that. And, um, then I decided like, I just, the world doesn't need another like hawk show about <laughs> stuff like that. So, um, I just took a break. I also was going to like, I was working on a film project, which looked like it was going to go somewhere. And then it ended up not going anywhere. Uh, it was going to be like a documentary, uh, unrelated to porn. Um, and not about me, but, um, we pitched it to some producers in New York city and looked like it was going to get some traction and it's kind of on hold right now. So that kind of put just oral on hold as well. I have this guy who's a doctor who uh, he's a gay doctor and, but he's in LA and he really wants to do the show too. But I mean, I'm, I couldn't be, we couldn't be more further apart from each other. So like the timing yeah. is just like, like, like I'd have to like, we'd have to record at like one in the morning or something. It'd be like so crazy. I was like, ah, can't do it. So anyway, yeah. So I have that. Look out for it. It might come back. Uh, we'll I'll publicize it or I'll promote it if it if it comes back. Uh, I have a lube, a brand of lube, uh, in conjunction or uh, in conjunction with uh, Ride Body Works, uh, which is like a gay lube brand. Um, they I have, my line is called Ride Rocco, and we have a silicone a water-based and a hybrid cum lube and you could buy it at uh ride .com. and then i just came out with my second dildo um because the first one sold out and then the company went out of business uh of making dildos <laughs> so like nobody could order a dildo for like five years um so finally, like I launched one last spring, it sold out. So then we got a second batch in and now we're getting low on the second batch. It's doing really well. It's really ginormous. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's people are like, is that really you? So here's the clarity on it because I'm not like, you know, I'm not trying to scam anybody. It is a true to life mold of my penis. So it's the exact shape of my penis, then digitally enhanced to be 15% bigger, which is industry practice. I'm not doing anything shady. Uh, and in this day and age, we were looking again at the target audience and guys love bigger things up their butt nowadays. 
Like, if you look at Twitter, like, there's a, I mean, yeah, guys love big toys. So we decided to make it a little bigger to satiate that part of the audience. That's really it. That's all for the plug. Really. Wow. My life's boring. I, uh, no, I, I, I appreciate you being honest on that because he's definitely one of the older ones. But do you remember Carlo Massi? Yes. Yes. How do I know him? Like Titan Men yes. way back in yes. the day. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Like I, I interviewed him and he was like, he's like, that thing they made in my dick. He's like, there is no way I am that big. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I just know it's industry practice. I'm not saying every single person does it, but it like literally when we were talking to the factory who was making it, they're like, oh yeah, we digitally enhance it. Like they literally would took the thing and then they, scanned it so it's all scanned in 3d and then they you know made it 15 percent bigger so um because it's like it's right. like you know i'm i'm at a show and i'm promoting it and it's like hi and people are like that's not you and i'm like yeah you're right it's not me but it's the exact exact mold of me so and i have video to prove it of me in the mold so nice. So where can people find your content? Like your social media, only fans, just for fans. Uh, so all my stuff. Twitter is uh, Rocco steel NYC. No, I don't live in NYC anymore, but I just never changed the name. Um, my Instagram is steel your daddy S T E E L E your daddy. Uh, it's my second Instagram account. I used to have, a lot more followers and they shut me down, but that seems to be what they do. Um, and so this is my second Instagram account. And then, oh, uh, OnlyFans uh, backslash Rocco Steel NYC, just for fans backslash Rocco Steel NYC, and for my fans backslash Rocco Steel. Wait, Rocco Steel? Yeah, just Rocco okay. Steel. And just to clarify one last time, how would you, like, if someone wants to subscribe to your content, how would you summarize it? Because I talk to people who shoot all kinds of shit. Yeah, I so. mean, I'm kind of boring. <laughs> but like, like, look, I like what I like, and I don't, like I said, I'm not into acrobatics. I'm not, because of where I live, I can't, I don't have access to all the resources that a lot of people have. So, like, I can't go to the the houses that people go to, right? Like they go to these big filming houses where there's like 30 guys there and they're having these massive orgies. So you're never going to find that right now on my site. You're going to find one-on-one. -on -one, I shouldn't say it's boring, but you're going to find one-on-one -on -one passionate, real sex uh, that's not fake. And you're not going to see, for the most part, cameramen, and lights, lights in the room, you're going to see a, it's got, it's my phone that I leaned up against the trash can in a hotel room <laughs> and like it's capturing real stuff. So that's what OnlyFans started out as six years ago was a way to share with your fans, your real sex life. That was how it started. And so the amateur aspect of it was very appealing for several years. Then COVID hit and everybody in the world started doing OnlyFans. And in order to outdo each other, people started hiring cameramen and crew and lighting crew and, and renting out fancy Airbnbs. Uh, and it's like, great, that's great. You'll never see that from me. I'm not going to shell out that kind of money for production when I believe the reason why we started OnlyFans in the first place was so that you could see real sex happening. Like, so I'm not going to like, I know guys that have literally assembly lines where there'll be 15 guys lined up in the room 
and the top will film about 10 minutes with each one of them. Now, that's one person I know that does that. Now, again, more power to him. But to me, that's not real sex. Like, yeah. more power to you. You're banging out 15 videos, like, in one afternoon. That's amazing. But, you know, yeah, you're just going to get, you're going to get real stuff with me. I mean, there I may, get that. Yeah. There may be once in a great while where it's like a doozy and it just didn't work out. And it doesn't feel like there's a connection in there because there probably isn't, you know? So. Yeah. Okay. One last question that uh, did come in. This is from Rocco Steel fans. Who among those who you've already been with do you want to have a rematch with? Mm, very good. And then second part is. Before he wanted Marcus Isaacs to have Whoa. seen with, I think he was now given another chance who his his ideal dream seemed. Wow. Like. So this person has been around since day one because Marcus Isaacs was the phone crash. <laughs> Do you know Marcus Isaacs? He no. was a, a Treasure Island media model. Oh, really okay. sexy guy. Um, but he was my porn crush when I started porn. And I finally got to film with him, I think twice. Um, anyway, um, my new... What was the last, was it, what was the very last question? The very, very last question. Or the very last part of that question. So, so it's... Who among those who you've already yeah. shot with do you want to have a rematch with? Second part is... Given another chance, who is your ideal slash dream scene partner okay. now? So to do a rematch, I think it, I'd be remiss if it wasn't with um, um, <laughs> oh my god, I'm terrible. No, this is like this part of I, aging for those this of you is watching. Early onset, everybody. This is early onset. Um, Armand Rizzo. Armand Rizzo. He was like, you know, okay. see, you're probably, he's, he was like my first, he's, it's why I, I, was, I think that's why I became so big because everybody saw the Armand Rizzo, the original Armand Rizzo scene that I did for, uh, forget the, the studio, but anyway, then Armand and I did it a scene again for my studio back in 2016. And now we we texted recently. We're like, we should, you know, forever in the same town, we should do one last <laughs> last reunion. Arma Rizzo, and then um, another one is Wade uh, Wade Wolfgar. Is another rematch I would like to do. And my ideal, my ideal. I feel like I've filmed with my ideal. I feel like everybody I want to. Um, I think my dream. Let's say who one that you haven't filmed with, one that you have filmed with. Gosh, I can't remember. So there's this trans boy in Colombia, Colombia, Colombia. I can't remember his name, but he's like I'm obsessed with him, and uh, yeah, I would I would really want to film with him. And then, um, so he's, he's somebody I've never filmed with yet. Um, somebody I have filmed with, but this is similar to the first part of the question. Who I want to rematch with. Yeah. Uh, okay. Someone you have filmed with where rematch isn't oh, possible yeah, awesome. for whatever. Uh, but why isn't it possible? I don't know. Maybe. They left the industry. Maybe you live too far Fair apart. Enough. So it's like the the forbidden fruit. Fair enough. Now, I honestly, I honestly don't know. Honestly, I feel like I've done everything I wanted to do. Um, yeah, that's going to require some reflection. Yeah, it'll 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 come to me the minute we hang up the call. 
and the and the <laughs> and the call and the show. Yeah. All right. Well, seriously though, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this, Rock. I I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. It was and fun. Uh, yeah, and don't hang up. Uh, but for those of you watching. Thank you for sticking around with us this long. I will post all of Rocco's links below that I can post. And if you're interested, all my stuff's just at Masculine Jason. And I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. Hey, guys, just want to say thank you for watching this video. And if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button. And on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that. It is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos, the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff, it is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.